Hello, welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very honored and privileged to be speaking with Stephen Holgate. Stephen is a professor of philosophy at the University of Warwick, United Kingdom. He's been teaching on Hegel's logic for over 30 years and is the author of several works on Hegel. Uh, the most recent, is, I would say, is probably his magnum opus, which is Hegel on Being, and this is in two volumes. Uh, the first volume is Quality and the Birth of Quantity in Hegel's Science of Logic, and the second volume is Quantity and Measure in Hegel's Science of Logic. And those are the two uh, volumes we talk about in this conversation. Um, we started by talking about how he came to write his two volumes on Hegel's Logic. Uh, we talk about what are the main aims of Hegel's logic and the use of categories. We talked about why Hegel believed that Kant's logic is not critical enough, how there's somewhat of an emptiness there. We talk about categories of thought and being and natural kinds, separating thinking and being. Talk a little bit about Hegel and Heidegger on being. Hegel on objective and being presuppositionless. We talk about pure being, becoming, nothing. Nietzsche and Hegel on becoming, Dasein, talk about Hegel and Frege on quantity, uh, mention a little bit of Hegel on differential calculus. Uh, we also talk about the linking of phenomenology of spirit, the other major work from Hegel and his logic, and uh, many other topics. I have to say this was such an honor. Uh, Stephen is quite lovely, brilliant, super brilliant, um, and really has uh, this exquisite way of explain i mean obviously really dense stuff from hegel's logic in in very understandable ways that doesn't uh, uh reduce it to anything re overly simplistic uh, the 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 two volumes hegel and being that he wrote are um, very specific very detailed but in very clear ways and uh i found it very very helpful in understanding uh hegel's logic as i was uh, returning to it and, and looking at it um, so this was this was an absolute treat to have him on and talk about these uh, two volumes for a couple of hours. Um, as always, you can find this podcast um, on my Substack, convergentdialogues.substack.com. I'm also on YouTube. Uh, you can get over there, those places. Subscribe, follow, like, share with your friends, and contribute if you'd like. And uh, now I bring you Stephen Bulgay. I am here with Stephen Hulgate. Uh, Stephen, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm uh, greatly looking forward to speaking with you. Good. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, and um, thank you for listening. Yeah. If uh, if indeed you are at the well, not at this point, but at some point in the future, I greatly appreciate it. There's not that many people out there that are particularly interested in Hegel's logic, so it's nice to know that there is a, a small community <laughs> uh, sharing uh, our enthusiasm for this work. You, you'd be surprised. There's you'd be, you'd be surprised. People people really do actually love philosophy. So I'm always I'm always interested to see people that they really uh, catch on to it, really like it and stuff. So you have written a, a kind of a, a magnum opus here. Uh, you've, you've written two volumes, um, two volumes on Hegel. Uh, let's see. The first one is uh, it's the blue one, right? Is the, the that's correct. Volume one that's is right. Hegel. So the, the the two volumes are Hegel and Bean, and the first one is uh, Quality and the Birth of Quantity in Hegel's Science of Logic. It's fabulous. And the second one is called Quantity and Measure in Hegel's Science of Logic. So the first question here, right out the gate, is how did you decide to write these two? <laughs> volumes on a pretty hard piece of philosophy i mean it's not easy to get through hegel anything of hegel much less his logic uh so what was uh, your main aim in discussing his logic and, and dr nabim okay well um, i should just explain first of all that i've uh, been studying and been interested in hegel uh for a long time i first encountered hegel way back in uh, i think it would be 1974 possibly or 75 when i was a student um, and um, so I've, and I've, I've worked on most of the areas in, uh, of Hegel's philosophy, uh, as well as on a lot of other philosophers. But um, Hegel's logic stands out for me as being, um, in a way, the key to uh, 
all the other parts of his philosophy. It's where mm. Hegel sets out his method to the extent he has one. And I think of it also as one of the great contributions to philosophy in the same vein as Aristotle's metaphysics or Spinoza's mm. uh, ethics, Kant's first critique, and so on. Um, but it's a very neglected work. Mm. It's not on standard reading lists. Barely anybody uh, studies it around the world, although you're right in what you said before, interest is, is actually growing somewhat. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in marked contrast to, let's say, the phenomenology or even the philosophy of right. 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 Particularly, um, the phenomenology was very popular in, in, in the 20th century in France. Um, and there were, there, yeah, there are people who have worked on the logic. Um, Marx was interested in Hegel's logic. Um, Lenin, some of you might know Lenin's commentary, uh, such as it is on, on Hegel's logic, and Gadamer and Heidegger and others. Um, but my feeling was that there wasn't, um, uh, or there hasn't been enough detailed studies of Hegel's logic um, that would do two things. Uh, first of all, um, I suppose, introduce uh, people who don't already know to my distinctive way of reading, which is, which is not just mine. Uh, I share it with people like Richard Winfield. Um, and this is to take seriously Hegel's claim to be thinking in a way that is systematically presuppositionless. Now, we might talk about what that means later. Mm -hmm. But that one of the reasons was to, to get that uh, to out there. Um, another reason was to shift attention, maybe not so much away from the more generic questions that people ask, you know, is Hegel a metaphysician? What's his relation to Kant? What's his mm. relation to Spinoza? Um, I wanted, as well as addressing those issues, to focus on the details, mm. because it seems to me that, you know, if you study Kant, you don't just read the introductions, uh, the prefaces in the introduction, you, you read the details of the, of, of, uh, of the text. Mm. Um, with Hegel, often um, people might get as far as being nothing and becoming, maybe a little bit further, they may dip into another section. But it's rare for people to work systematically through the whole text. Mm. Um, so I wanted to do that. Um, now, you can't do that with the whole book. Um, so I took the first part of, of, of Hegel's logic. They, it's divided into three parts, being, essence, and the concept. I took the first part. And um, I have written on, on this before, um, but I only got as far as the section uh, uh, on infinity. I mean, if, I, if that doesn't sound a little bit too odd, I only got as far as infinity. <laughs> um, but um, uh, so what I decided to do in this case was to work through the rest of the section on quality, the whole of the section on quantity and their measure, which are severely neglected, mm. um, and to try and explain the transition into essence. And so that, that would set me up for what hopefully is going to be the next project. Mm. Um, um, along the way, I guess I've got two aims. One is to explain what it is to think in the way Hegel does. Mm. So what is it to do speculative logic? Mm. So this is a philosophical endeavor. This is not just an exercise in the history of philosophy. Um, the second is to actually help people read the text, mm. because there are interpretations of Hegel out there, his logic, his phenomenology, which make great sense, they're wonderful, but then if you try and go back to the text and make sense of the text on the basis of that interpretation, it often is very hard to do that. Mm. So I wanted to write something that would enable students, other scholars, interested uh, uh, people to actually pick up Hegel's logic and to work through and understand, if not every single sentence, mm. quite a lot of the sentences. Mm. So that matters a lot to me, that um, uh, I, I was trained in modern languages and in literature, and so the atten attention to the details of the text and helping people understand how Hegel's sentences work uh, was also very important, but um, as I say, primarily mm. uh, trying to explain the nature of Hegel's logic and what it is to think speculatively, I guess. Mm. So those were my broad no, my broad No, that's great. Well, it comes out because, uh, you know, <clears throat> I hadn't read uh, the logic in a long time, and it's, it's difficult, it's not easy to get through, but reading your, 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 your work here was, it felt like a very nice uh, compendium or a kind of compliment to it. It was like, oh, okay, I can kind of walk through this and you know, I could read this, you know, if I, if I took more time, you know, to read the logic, I could, you know, 
kind of have this. It's like, well, this this doesn't make sense. Let me see. Let's let's see what Steven says about this and try and kind of, oh, okay, I have like a kind of a uh, little bit of a tool to kind of help my my own brain think through it. So it, it does. It, the writing is very clear, and you know, it's not always clear with with Hegel sometimes. So I should I should have- yes. And this was quite sorry. Just, this is quite important. It struck me that there's no point <laughs> in being just as clear or even less clear than Hegel. Um, <laughs> you know, we we already have that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's very important. Mm-hmm. Um, so so in a way, I suppose then what am I doing? I'm one one of my feet is is in Hegel mm. and I'm trying to think along with Hegel. Mm. But the other foot's got to be slightly slightly outside mm. so that I can present the arguments that that that, that I think Hegel's presenting mm. in a way that that's that's intelligible and accessible mm. and perhaps you know ad- addresses some of the concerns I know that my own students might have. Mm. Uh, and perhaps that are slightly different from the ones that Hegel students would have had. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I think it's important to have that sli- somewhat double perspective, mm. and I've tried to adopt that in the book. Mm. Before before we move on, I I uh, I, I should uh, I should uh, I should ask the important question: Is uh, could you give us the the ninety second kind of uh, potted biography of, of what you do academically and professionally? So so listeners know. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of Warwick. Uh, or Warwick, I suppose, Dion Warwick, if you know who that's Warwick, we pronounce it, um, which is right bang in the middle of England. Um, I um, uh, studied modern languages at Cambridge uh, back in the, in the 1970s, French and German, and um, got interested in philosophy, partly because of a wonderful um, seminar that was run by uh, Nicholas Boyle, who then became my PhD supervisor. And the great attraction of it was a we got to give presentations and B, there was tea and cakes or tea and biscuits in the middle of the seminar, uh, which was really good. No, I mean, yeah, it was wonderful. It was wonderful to do. And we studied Leibniz and Kant and Hegel. So I got enthusiastic mm. uh, uh, um, uh, for Hegel in, from that point of view. Then I spent, um, uh, as part of my studies, uh, years, two years away in Germany, one in Tübingen. Mm. Uh, I was actually in um, uh, Tübingen. I was able to um, uh, go to lectures by Hans Kung. Mm. And um, and Klaus Hartmann, who wrote on the on the logic, and then before that, actually in the mid seventies, I was in Freiburg. In fact, I was in Freiburg the year Heidegger died. Oh wow! So along with a number of other people, rushed out and got my copy of Der Spiegel with the interview, which I still have, oh, still cool. treasure, and cool. occasionally read it. Anyway, so uh, so it was Hartmann's lectures, I think, probably that 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 showed me that the way to read Hegel's logic is to think about it, not just to sort of follow the text, mm-hmm. to really think about it, but also to pay really close attention to the details of what Hegel is saying. Mm-hmm. And, um, and although I don't, don't agree with everything that Hartmann has said, that, that model would, would, would stay with me. I think it was very important. Mm-hmm. Um, I then had, a, I was very fortunate, I had research fellowships, which is one of the postdocs, basically, mm-hmm. um, over here. One was at Edinburgh, and then I, I moved over to the U.S., um, mm. to DePaul, with the, my family. Nice. My wife's from America anyway, so it was, it was nice for her uh, to be over there for a while. So I was at DePaul for eight years. Mm. And I guess that's probably where I developed um, the distinctive interpretation that I had, largely in relation to relentless questioning from, from a number of absolutely wonderful graduate students mm. coming from Heidegger, Gadamer, mm. and Derrida. Mm. Mm. very much about, you know, what are you talking mm-hmm. about? How on earth can Hegel <laughs> be thinking without presuppositions? Surely all understanding has presuppositions. <laughs> and I tried to sort of hone my understanding of Hegel uh, in, in dialogue with these, mm. with these students. Mm. Um, and that then issued in the, in the first book. Um, then in 1995, we moved back to Warwick, and I've been at Warwick ever since. Mm. And um, uh, I'm very fortunate. It's a great place. Mm. We have a lot of uh, staff and students interested in post-Kantian European philosophy. Uh, And apart from Hegel, I mean, I'm interested in Marx, uh, Nietzsche. My first book was on Hegel and Nietzsche. I teach Spinoza, Leibniz. Mm. I've taught Plato. I've taught all manner of stuff. So um, Mm. I'm I'm clearly rooted in Hegel. Mm -hmm. But but I also teach and have written on a lot of other figures. In fact, I find writing, you know, Hegel and Rawls or Mm. Derrida or Heidegger Mm. or Marx or Fichte or Schelling or whoever is is a really helpful way of getting into focus what I think Hegel's doing because I've got a counterpart yeah. that I've also got to take into account. Mm. And, and because of my training, I don't believe one should just take 
everything Hegel says about other thinkers at mm. face value. Mm. Yeah, that's great. He's not always a good reader of Kant or of Spinoza. So, mm. you know, that that's a good discipline. So anyway, that's that's basically the No, no, that's 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 so wonderful. Uh yeah, kind of the last point there, it's almost like it's a it's like having a conversation between two thinkers and you know, everyone kind of builds off of each other. You know, everyone talks about uh, you know, philosophers that came before them and thinkers that came before them. So that's actually very, very nice. Yeah. I think it's crucial. I mean, you know, uh, let's say Schelling. Uh, mm -hmm. Schelling uh, uh, has very significant criticisms of Hegel's logic as a whole and specific arguments. I think he's wrong. Mm -hmm. However, it is very good to engage yeah. with Schelling's criticisms. Sure. Yeah. And, and it forces me to think, well, why do I think he's going on? Where do I think he's going wrong? Um, and um, so I think that's eminently worthwhile. And, and it's part of the process that that, that gets one to think differently about the text and actually helps me to understand better what Hegel's doing. Mm, yeah. So we're going to get to in, kind of in the first part of the first book and the first volume, you talk about a lot about uh, this kind of this, this kind of conversation between Hegel and, and Kant. So we'll, we'll get there in a minute. But maybe it, it would be helpful for listeners to uh, to kind of have like a, a what are the main aims of the logic of, of Hegel? Um, and so he talks about in the logic, the clarifying these you know, basic categories of thought, how mm -hmm. we understand objects, um, how human experience is mediated by categories. So maybe just talk a little bit about those pieces, but really just what's the main aims of the, of Hegel's logic. Okay. Uh, I take Hegel's logic to be, to have a twofold, uh, function. Um, and this reflects, if you like, the, 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 the sort of double-sidedness in the idea of a category. Obviously, the term category comes from Aristotle, it's also in Kant, um, and Hegel is in that tradition of thinking that um, categories are crucial to our understanding and engaging with the world. So we don't, for Hegel, just open our eyes and then ping, you know, the, the objects are there, yeah. that categories play an important role in, in particular, and this is where Hegel, I think, is very close to Kant, in conferring on what we see and hear um, the form of being an object. Mm. Um, Hegel's claim is that, that what we see, the actual visual sensations, just present us with colors and shapes. But there's no object there. Mm. Uh, we think what we see to be an object through the categories. So... This is pretty much close uh, to Kant. Um, now, what Kant tries to do, um, obviously there's the transcendental deduction in which Kant tries to show that the categories are the necessary conditions for the objects of experience. But in the so-called metaphysical deduction, which precedes the transcendental deduction, he simply tries to discover the categories, derive them mm. from what he takes to be the most uh, fundamental and minimal activity of thinking, which is judging. Mm. So the functions of judgment then yield the categories. Um, and that is Kant's metaphysical deduction, his, his derivation and justification of those categories. I take Hegel to be following Fichte uh, in trying to provide a more rigorous, less question-begging derivation of those categories. Mm. And for Fichte, that requires that we start with the basic thought that the I posits the I and the I posits the not I and the categories can be derived from that. Hegel has a more minimal beginning. He thinks you can just start with thought itself that's reduced itself to nothing but but being, indeterminate being, mm. and that the categories can be derived from that. So Hegel's logic is an attempt to derive, uh, explain, clarify the fundamental categories of thought. Um, I suppose in Kantian language, you would say the unschematized categories. That's the categories before we've got space and time. Mm. Um, but I think in Hegel's mind, uh, this project coincides with the derivation of the basic categories of being. Mm. And that's because Hegel thinks that thinking thinks being. This is Hegel's big um, point of disagreement with Kant. For Kant, thought thinks at most possibility. And for us to have um, something actual really there, we have to combine our thoughts, our categories with sensuous intuitions. And it's only the combination of those two mm. that gives us cognition of something real in the world. And of course, that's limited by the conditions of sensuous intuition itself. Yeah. Hegel doesn't accept that view. Hegel thinks that um, thought in and of itself can think being, can bring, bring being to mind in a way that Spinoza thought. Mm. 
or that Parmenides thought, or that Leibniz thought. And so an account of the basic categories of thought for Hegel coincides with an account of the basic categories of being. Mm. That means that Hegel's logic is not just a, a, a more rigorous version of Kant's metaphysical deduction. It's also, if you like, a more rigorous, less question-begging version of Spinoza's ethics, mm. let's say, mm. um, in that it starts not with substance, but with being. Mm -hmm. But again, it tries to derive various fundamental aspects of being from uh, pure being itself. So I think that's what the logic is about. It's, it's a work of, of, of logic insofar as it is trying to tell us what it is to think properly. What are the fundamental categories of thought? But it's also a work of metaphysics or ontology mm -hmm. in that it's telling us what it is to be. It's not an epistemology. I don't think it's a transcendental philosophy, mm -hmm. although we can discuss that. Mm -hmm. And it's not yet a philosophy of nature or a philosophy of, mm. of, of history. Mm. It, it's, it's, it's an ontologic, mm -hmm. but without the implications that I think Heidegger would, would, mm -hmm. would, would put on that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's what the logic is doing. Um, and um, I regard it as a philosophical enterprise, as significant as, as I mentioned before, Aristotle's metaphysics or Spinoza's ethics or... Um, you know Kant's Kant's first critique, um, and my, I want people to take it more seriously than they have done so far. Yeah, so that's that's very helpful. So we we can get into the, some of the stuff with Kant because I think the categories are there. So this in the book you talk about how Hegel believes, or that there's this critique that Kant's examination of categories <clears throat> weren't critical enough. There's this emphasis that there's, this, there's not enough critique, that he's almost that he's just taking some things as face value. Well, we call it this, so that's what it is. And, and we don't go, how do we get to this way of making categorizations? So how, does, how is it for Hegel that Kant is not looking at, you know, this true logical content of categories, you know, throughout? How are, how are Kant's categories, I guess, empty, if you will? Okay, good question. Um, um, this is whether this fits Kant in every respect. Let's leave that to one side for a minute. This is Hegel's view of Kant. <laughs> let's just say that. So Hegel's view of Kant is that Kant um, took uh, the categories of understanding. Those would be fundamental concepts like finite and infinite, cause and effect, substance and accident, reality and negation, and so mm -hmm. on. Um, and Kant worried about the epistemic status of those categories. In other words, to what extent can they yield knowledge? Yeah. And under what conditions can they yield knowledge? And Hegel's Kant concludes that they can yield knowledge only in conjunction with sensory intuitions. Those sensory intuitions have a priori conditions, which are transcendentally ideal, ergo, the categories can yield knowledge only of objects of experience or appearances, not of things as they are in themselves. Mm. Um, and I think actually in that respect, Hegel's Kant matches Kant's Kant. <laughs> um, um, so in, in, in Hegel's mind, that in a way is the extent of Hegel's, uh, I'm sorry, of, of, in Hegel's mind, that's the extent of Kant's critique of the categories, that he limits the range of validity of those categories to the objects of experience. But what Kant doesn't do is look at the categories themselves and ask, has the tradition, has understanding understood those categories properly? Mm -hmm. So to take an example, so this becomes a bit more concrete, um, take the category of substance. Uh, the Aristotelian understanding of substance would be, it is that which um, cannot be predicated of something else, but of which things can be predicated. So a substance is basically a subject which can never be a predicate of anything mm -hmm. else. Well, that's pretty much Kant's notion of substance, to be honest. It's not changed. Mm. The only thing is that Kant thinks, A, that that category has a restricted epistemic validity. Mm. It can be used to know objects in the world, and it can be used to think, let's say, God, but it can't yield any knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. So that's one limit. Uh, and the other thing, uh, and I suppose this is connected to this, is Kant thinks that a category like substance only really makes sense, has meaning, zin, when it's connected to sensibility, mm. when it is schematized. Mm -hmm. So a schema basically is a 
temporal expression of a category. Mm. So you have the purely logical category of substance uh, and, 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 and accidents, and the temporal expression of that is permanence in time. Mm -hmm. And Kant thinks for substance to mean something in our experience, it's got to take the form not just of substance, but of permanence in time. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, I suppose you could say he does um, amend the way that categories have been thought in that he thinks that each category has to have a necessary temporal counterpart, which is also a condition of experience. But he doesn't alter the basic way for substance is understood. Um, and, okay, there's another, uh, uh, another point that goes along with that, and that is that there are a number of sharp divisions mm. that Kant relies on. Um, so take, for example, the distinction between the real and the negative. Um, Kant thinks that both those categories are necessary. They belong in the, in, in the categories of quality, reality, and negation. But they're quite distinct from one another, which is why the tradition could come up with the idea of the most real being, the most real being in which there is no negation. Think of Spinoza's substance that has no negation mm -hmm. in it. Well, for Kant, although he disagrees with Spinoza a lot of things, that's perfectly intelligible to have the most real being that has no negation. So Kant does not think that the relationship between reality and negation needs to be rethought in such a way that negation informs reality at its very heart. Hegel thinks you do have to do that. Take also quality and quantity. Um, uh, Kant argues at one point that um, the following judgment is synthetic a priori, mm -hmm. namely the straight line between two points is the shortest. Now Kant understands straight to be a qualitative uh, term and quantity to be, uh, sorry, short to be a quantitative term. So you've got straight, uh, a straight line between two points is the shortest, so the quality brings with it a certain quantity, yeah. but the connection is synthetic. Mm. It's not analytic. Mm. That means there's no intrinsic logical connection mm. between being straight and being short, mm. between quality and quantity. Mm. They're different categories. The under understanding keeps them separated. Hegel thinks, hang on, that's not altogether true. If we think through quality to its logical conclusion, it makes quantity necessary. Mm. In fact, quantity is a form of quality that has a distinctive character, and then that quantity makes quality necessary itself. So in those respects, I think Hegel thinks Kant is just not thinking deeply enough and critically enough about the logical structure of the categories because he's so hung up on the question of whether they are epistemically limited or not, mm. and I think he thinks they are. So I think that's what Hegel means by saying that Kant is not critical enough. Mm. Um, it's a little bit like, um, uh, I suppose what Kant is doing is making us think about the limitations of our cognition, but not really asking about whether the components of our cognition are properly understood. Mm. He's just saying, let's take the components of cognition, intuitions, and categories, and give them a more limited validity. But let's not investigate particularly how the categories have to be understood. He says, I could give you the definitions of these things, but I'm not going to do that. Or if I do, I'll do it in a later work of metaphysics, but I'm not going to do it here. Mm -hmm. And Hegel's saying, no, 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 no. You need to think about this from the very start, mm. because otherwise one is simply taking for granted how these categories are to be understood. Mm. So I think that's what he means by... Um, Kant being uncritical. Um, and just, just one little addendum, because I realize I didn't answer one of your questions. Um, what, what Hegel means by saying that Kant's categories are empty is that they require sensuous intuitions in order to be genuinely meaningful. Mm. I think Hegel knows that categories, that Kant's categories aren't completely empty <laughs> of themselves because they are distinguished logically. There is a logical distinction for Kant between the various categories he sets out. So in that sense, they have a, a logical content. Mm. Kant doesn't deny that, and Hegel understands yeah. that. But, but the categories aren't meaningful without being connected to sensuous intuitions, and that's what mm. Hegel means by them being empty. Mm. That's very interesting. Let me ask this. I can't remember if you talk about it in the book or whatever, but there's this, you talk about, we're talking about categories, 
And sometimes one of the categories I would say, or one thing that people talk about is this idea of, of natural kinds. Yeah. There's, there's these kinds of, of things that we have naturally. And the question here becomes in terms of how, as a human being, as an organism, we're able to categorize all of these things. We're able to say this is this versus not this. Or, you know. And I guess the question here for me is, in some sense, isn't all of these things just heuristics we have? Or they're labels for things that we have. And when you get to the, the, the being at the bottom of it, how, how much can we know, right? When we look at things like uh, <clears throat> objects in the world, or we look at uh, ideas in our mind, or we look at things like, you know, things that seem very much like, yes, I mean, I, I, I see the tree, or I see the color red, or things like that. Are these just not ways in which, could, could we ever, this is kind of getting to the, the presuppositions piece, which I'm jumping ahead, but can <laughs> we ever really, we just call these things, these, these things, we just categorize them. It, it's, it's not in and of themselves innately red or a tree. Those are the ways in which we categorize them. No, how can we know the kind of pure being of a thing uh, or, or, or how we have all these things categorized? Is that not just a, a human, a human way of grouping things together? Okay, good question again. Um, I think we need to distinguish, um, make a number of distinctions. First of all, we need to distinguish between empirical concepts, uh -huh. you know, tree uh -huh. and so on, and and a priori concepts and categories. Um, and, and of course, that distinction is familiar to people who work on Kant. Um, but there's also a distinction that Hegel draws between the a priori concepts uh, set out in logic, mm -hmm. uh, and then further a priori concepts that he finds in, uh, in, in nature and, and in, in, in history. Um, so Hegel in the logic is, is not concerned with empirical concepts. Mm -hmm. He's concerned with the fundamental concepts um, that he thinks are the fundamental concepts of thought. So I think, let's just look at that for a minute. Um, even if one was a metaphysical skeptic and one thought, okay, come on, Hegel, you know, you, you, you can't know that what we think will tell us about being. Um, even if we accepted that, which I think is not what Hegel believes, but anyway, even if, if we accepted that, Hegel's argument would still be the categories that he's developing are not just contingent, they're not just uh, of pragmatic use. Mm. They are derived from the very nature of thinking. Mm. And the way he tries to show that is by, first of all, stripping down thought to its minimum. Mm. And he thinks the minimum is not judgment as Kant thought. It's not even the relationship between the I and the not I as Fichte thought. It is thought as pure being. Um, the best way to think about this is to think of Descartes' cogito. Yeah. And think of D Descartes stripping away all that we know about ourselves and about the world and about God until we're left with, I think, therefore I am, and then get rid of the I. Get rid of the I. And you just have thinking as being. Mm -hmm. Not, I think, therefore I mm -hmm, am, mm -hmm. but just thinking, therefore being. And Hegel thinks, okay, if we've done that and we've stripped away all assumptions and presuppositions about thinking, and we then undertake an imminent investigation of thought itself, mm -hmm. see where that bare being of thought leads mm -hmm. us, we will discover the fundamental categories of thought. Mm -hmm. And so Hegel thinks he does, he does that. And he thinks that, the, that, that what, what gives his account, uh, what makes his account preferable, let's say, to Kant's account, is that it's not as question-begging. It doesn't begin from an assumption about the nature of thinking. It doesn't begin from the idea that thinking is judgment, mm -hmm. or it has to abide by certain rules of syllogistic inference. Um, and it is rigorously imminent. What it's trying to do is not just import our own bright ideas into our understanding of thinking, but to if you like, allow thought to unfold its own intrinsic categories. Hmm. Now, all this would hold even if the logic had nothing to do with being, hmm. even if it wasn't a metaphysics, it was just a logic. Then I think Hegel would still want to argue that the categories that he's unfolding here are necessary ones. 
But of course, they're not empirical categories. He's not making that claim about empirical categories. He's making that claim about much more fundamental ideas, the very thought that there is something at all. You know, we open our eyes, I see a tree out of my window. One of the things I can say about that tree is that it is something in relation to something else. Where do I get the idea of something from? Why do I even think there is a something there? Yeah. Well, Hegel thinks you can argue that. Um, I think the tree's very big. Where do I get the idea of quantity from, mm -hmm. from size? Mm -hmm. Why do I think it's big? Well, he thinks you can show the necessity for that. Um, then, excuse me, then, of course, you add in the other side to the logic which Hegel believes in, that in fact, that um, necessary series of categories of thought also uh, coincides with the necessary series of categories of being. Mm. And the reason for that, I think, is, uh, so why is it that he thinks thought thinks being? It's for two reasons. One I've already highlighted briefly is that, it, again, if we follow Descartes, and thought reduces itself to sheer being. It doesn't reduce itself to the thought of being, it reduces itself to nothing but indeterminate mm -hmm. being. Mm -hmm. Remember, I think, therefore I am. Get rid of the I, thinking, therefore, being. Um, and then if we also say, well, actually, the demands of self-criticism require that we can't take being to be any more than that indeterminacy, we have no reason for separating being off from the being that thought reduced itself to. Um, you would need to have some reason to say, oh, no, being is something other than that. Well, what justifies that? Mm. We've got a starting point with thought um, reducing itself to being, and we have no justification at the beginning for thinking that being is any more than that. The other way of thinking about this is to think that for Hegel, it is thought, not imagination, not feeling, not sensibility, that opens up for us a a space of being. We do say things like, it doesn't just look like a squirrel, it is a squirrel. <laughs> it doesn't just look like an X, it is an X. Where do we get that idea of being an X from? Mm -hmm. Now, we all operate with it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we couldn't draw a distinction between an, an appearance or an illusion and, and, and what's real. But where do we get the idea of real from? You know, the fish in my tank downstairs don't go around thinking that's real. They're just looking for food. Um, but we have this idea that, 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 that what confronts us, some of what confronts us is, it's real. Where do we get that from? Hegel thinks it's thinking that gives us that. Thought discloses and opens up being. Imagination doesn't, he thinks. Feeling doesn't. Sensibility doesn't. And so from that point of view, our fundamental categories of thinking are ways in which our thought opens up mm. fundamental ways of being. Mm, mm, yeah. And so again, they coincide with one another. Mm. Um, now, this doesn't, so going back to your original point, this does not in and of itself mean that our empirical concepts mm -hmm. have purchase on the world in quite the same way. Yeah. Um, and I think Hegel thinks that empirical concepts are much more revisable uh, mm. and, and sort of open-ended in, mm. in, in that respect. Although in the philosophy of nature, he does think there are aspects of nature that have the same a priori status mm. as, um, as the categories of the logic. And, but that's, that's another story. But, but empirical concepts, it might well be that empirical concepts are in some sense, as you describe them, heuristic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A, but even if that were the case, that wouldn't be true, Hegel thinks at least, for the fundamental ways in which we divide up uh, the world. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very, very, uh, you, you explain it very, very well. I, that makes a lot of intuitive sense. Um, so the, I have two questions here on this. The first is, in Hegel's mind then, could you strip away being from thinking? Are those always inexplicably linked together? You cannot have one without the other. And I guess second to that is, you know, just as a kind of, uh, you know, uh, a preview of how things turn out, you know, how does this kind of all of Hegel's ideas fit in with all of, we might get to it later, but all of Heidegger's ideas about Dasein and being and things like that as well, where he's also very preoccupied with, you know, being and being mm -hmm. possessive and it's our Dasein and we have to, you know, on this uncovering piece. 
But how can can you strip away thinking then from being, or or are they always linked together? Is it almost like a space time thing? It's always together kind of thing. Um, they are always together. I mean, one can always abstract mm. in Hegel's view, but I think I think he would have a thought that's somewhat analogous to Descartes, that if you strip away being from thinking, what you do is you reduce thinking to a simple immediacy, which is just being again. <laughs> so, so the fact is, you know, as, as Descartes does, you, you strip away the thought that, that, that uh, you know, I'm sitting here, um, that, that there's a God, uh, and so on, uh, and I, I I strip away everything, but but I can't get away from the thought that 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 I am, and my very act of abstracting confirms that I am. Hegel is, as I say, stripping away the I, but I think he would say uh, something similar to that: that that trying to abstract away thinking just if you like confines us to the simple immediacy of thinking, but that immediacy is initially is all we mean by being. Mm, mm. So we get back. To being again, yeah, yeah. Um, and remember that, that that there are really two parts of this idea. There's the there's the idea that thinking and being are irreducible, but also the other idea that at the start of thinking, we are not permitted to understand being to be any more than this indeterminate immediacy to which thought reduces itself. Yeah. This is really really important. Yeah. Because otherwise you could say, oh, well, I mean, sure, Hegel, thought reduces itself to pure being, to this simple immediacy. But what does that being have to do with the being I live in? Well, what being do you live in? What can you assume about it? Mm. Can you assume that it's nature? Do you know what nature means? Aren't these all just further presuppositions that in the interests of being truly self-critical, we've got to set to one side? Mm -hmm. So I think... Spinoza gets very close to Hegel mm. because Spinoza starts with a very reduced conception of what there is. There is really, for Spinoza at the start, just being that is intelligible through causality as the cause of itself, substance. Yeah. Hegel's just saying, well, let's go a little bit more minimal on that. Let's get rid of intelligibility through causality and just start with being. Mm -hmm. But what we certainly can't do is assume from the start that we inhabit history, nature. I mean, yes, we know that. I mean, he's not saying we don't know that. Of course we don't. But when we're doing philosophy, we can't assume as a principle that we are fundamentally natural beings or linguistic beings or historical beings, because we will just be taking for granted what we mean by those things. Mm -hmm. And for Hegel, the whole problem with philosophy has been philosophers just taking for granted what they're supposed to be investigating. So if we're not going to take for granted either how to think or what there is, we've got to start with thought in its most minimal form, which reduces itself to indeterminate being, and being in its minimal form, which reduces itself to indeterminate being. And so there's no difference between the two. Mm. Um, that's, I think, how Hegel proceeds. Um, so to answer your question, just to repeat it again, I think Hegel would say any attempt to separate thought from being would just reduce thought to sheer immediacy, indeterminate immediacy, which is initially all we are allowed to think by being. But, but so is it, we, 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 you couldn't separate the two. Yeah, yeah, that, I, 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 follow, I follow the logic. <laughs> but I guess, the, <laughs> I guess the question is, it's like, I mean, this might be a different question, right? So I can fit in two other questions here. But the question here is, is well, don't things exist this might be the empirical claim, so you can you can stop me if I if I get there. But things do exist outside our being and our thought. Yeah, like they do exist. That that's that's the claim that people would make, right? But does it even matter if we don't know it? If our being and our way of of interacting in the world, it, we we may if we can't know it through our being through thought, <clears throat> whether it objectively exists or not, it doesn't almost matter. Maybe that's an empirical question. But uh, what, what do you think here? Uh, well, I, I mean, obviously, Hegel's not denying things exist. Of course, we, we've got to remember that that Hegel is, is is or was rather, you know, a being in the world who you know had a history, was acutely aware of his historical situation. He was, um, uh, you know, quite a passionate figure in some ways, uh, and and um, um, and you know, he's well aware of that being situated. Yeah. The question is, how do we justify 
what we understand the world to be. And Hegel thinks that just starting with the idea that you know things exist, mm -hmm. um, even if one part of us knows that's true, raises the question, well, what do we mean by they exist? Mm -hmm. What do we mean by mm -hmm. things? How are those things to be understood? And how do we show that those things are somehow necessary or those ways of being are necessary? Um, how do we show that the categories through which we understand the things we take to exist are necessary? And how do we do it without simply begging the question and, and assuming at the very beginning the very thing we're supposed to be inquiring into? Mm -hmm. so, so Hegel thinks that in terms of doing philosophy, we've got to suspend these assumptions, even what seems to be the most obvious assumption that there's something out there. Again, Descartes is a little bit of a model here. Yeah, yeah. You know, and remember that for Descartes, uh, there's a moment where you have to pass through a kind of philosophical questioning that is equivalent to madness. <laughs> there's that reference to the King of France who thought he yeah, was, yeah. Uh, had a head made of glass. <laughs> and and Ka uh, Descartes effectively saying, I'd be no less mad to doubt, but I'm going to do it because I'm going to, philosophy requires that we move in a direction that ordinary understanding will think is mad. Now, I don't think Hegel puts it quite that way, but I think he thinks similarly. Philosophy has got to take um, skepticism and suspending assumptions to a degree that ordinary experience would regard as excessive, mm. because it's only in that way that we can free ourselves from the assumptions and presuppositions that otherwise just dominate uh, uh, the world we live in. Um, and that's why, yes, I know, and you know, and Hegel knew that, that there are things out there. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to discover what it is to be a thing, you know, what it is to exist at all, is existing the same as being? Is existing the same as being real? Mm -hmm. Does existing discriminate between being a mechanical, a chemical, a living object, between historical existence and natural existence? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's so many questions to yeah, ask. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Hegel thinks you've got to go back to the beginning and start with a very minimal starting point yeah. and then derive mm -hmm. uh, the categories and, and, and in the course of that show that, in fact, existence flows from being, mm. according to Hegel. It is a necessary form that being takes. Now, existence has a technical term for Hegel that uh, uh, maybe we don't need to go into. But... but um, and indeed, he thinks that there is a necessary distinction between different ways in which things exist. Yeah, yeah. So he's very anti-reductive. Mm -hmm. Living beings aren't the same mm -hmm. as a bag of billiard mm -hmm. balls. Mm -hmm. There are structural differences. <laughs> And, and so he's tried to explain that. Um, just a word on the Heidegger. Um, yeah, because I, I hear so much of Heidegger and being in time you know, coming from all the stuff from Hegel. Right. Here. I mean, OK, I, I, I should admit sort of publicly that, uh, that I'm, not, I'm not a Heidegger expert, although I have read some of it and, and talked about it a lot with students, of course, and, um, and even written a little bit. Um, uh, so broadly speaking, I take um, Hegel and Heidegger to um, come very close at the very beginning of the logic, mm. even though I think Heidegger misses this, in sharing a certain conception of the ontological difference. What do I mean by that? What I mean simply is that for Hegel, being at the start of the logic is not a being. Being is just being. It's not a mm. thing. Okay. It's not an entity. It's not a being. Being is not a being for Hegel. Now, the difference is that I think that distinction between being and beings in Heidegger, although it, obviously it's not an absolute one, because, you know, uh, precisely because for Heidegger, being is not a thing, it's, it's not another thing than things. Um, uh, and Heidegger will go on to understand it in, in, in some senses as Eichnis or as the escaped, as, as sort of the giving of things. Um, but I think one could say that for Heidegger, that ontological difference is, um, well, I'm just going to put it out there and other people can argue, is that it's pretty fundamental throughout. I think Hegel's got a different view in that he thinks that pure being, which is not a thing, not a being, actually determines itself to take the form of beings. Hmm. So that for Hegel, as we move through the logic right at the very beginning, what it is to be 
will prove to be being determinate, being something, being a finite entity, being one amongst many. Mm. That doesn't mean to say that being is something finite, mm -hmm. but that to be is to be finite. Mm. Being is being finite, among other things. Mm. And that there is a logic through which being determines itself to take these different forms. I don't think Heidegger would be very happy with mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other things, that, other differences. I mean, for, to my eyes, uh, Heidegger looks too quasi-transcendental mm. in the way that he argues, mm. um, whereas I don't think Hegel is a transcendental philosopher. And I know that's controversial and <laughs> puts me at odds with some commentators, but I don't think Hegel's a transcendental philosopher. Um, so, uh, but I think, I think there's one other, if I can yeah, take, yeah, as you yeah. mentioned Heidegger, yeah. one other aspect that's really, really important to my understanding of Hegel and that does align very closely with Heidegger. And this is the emphasis on lassen, the German word lassen, to let. Mm. Um, Hegel is often thought of as a philosopher of activity, you know, spirit is act. Um, but people don't always take account of the fact that for Hegel, to think is to let the true nature of being unfold itself and determine our thinking. Mm. Hegel uses a lot of expressions. One of them is gewähren lassen, to allow to hold sway. Mm. So what we're doing in thinking in the logic is we're not having a lot of interesting ideas about being. We're not making a lot of judgments about being. We're not, we're not eng engaging in syllogistic inference about being. We are endeavoring to allow being to hold sway in our thinking and to unfold itself and to determine our thinking. Mm. That element of passivity, which involves activity because it's a lot of hard work, mm. you've got to hold yourself to what being shows itself to be, mm. is a kind of letting, mm. a lassen. Now, Heidegger, of course, lassen, sein lassen, mm. is crucial yeah. for Heidegger. And I'm not saying they say exactly the same thing, absolutely not at yeah. all. But the fact that those two thinkers, Hegel and Heidegger, see a certain comportment of lesson, of letting, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as central to the philosophical enterprise, I think is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and I mean, maybe other people highlight it, but it's certainly central to my mm -hmm. reading of, of Hegel. Mm -hmm. um, and the difficulty is then holding together how thinking can be active and passive at the same yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and my view is that, that, that Hegel thinks that passivity isn't just a matter of sitting back and letting it happen. Mm -hmm. It takes hard work. We've got to, you've got to discipline yourself to hold yourself mm -hmm. to what being shows to mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's the equivalent of one politician having to make the effort to actually listen to what someone else says, <laughs> rather than just, you know, how difficult is that? We know it's impossible for most of them. It's a lot of work <laughs> yes, to yes. let somebody else have a say. And I think this is what Hegel wants to do with being. So anyway, I just want yeah, to no, throw no, that that's, in. I, I like, the, I like the, the, the distinction there. This is very important. I want to I want to come to to becoming, but before we do, I'm going to. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, many of these concepts, but we can. I'm just going to fuse them together. A lot of the times, people will talk about things as being objective, right? Want to know things objectively or things like that. And you talk about Hegel's three meanings of objective, which are what lies outside space, what is universal and necessary, and something in itself. Um, and so maybe just talk about that. Uh, and how he wants philosophy to be presuppositionalist, right? So we can we can kind of mm -hmm. putting that. How do we? How can we be objective? Maybe in these three ways. How do we not come with presuppositions? And how he he uses this to talk about his his speculative logic, which we've kind of been dancing around here. Okay. Um, yes. Um, so going back to the Kant, um, uh, there's one one sense of objective, I suppose, well, maybe just an ordinary sense of objective, is the idea that, you know, something's out there in space. <laughs> it would still be there if we weren't mm -hmm. here. Um, well, I mean, neither Kant nor Hegel denies that, that things are, are objective in that, in that sense. Um, uh, even, even if the very form of space is transcendentally ideal for Kant, yeah. he still thinks that it has, things in space have empirical reality. Mm -hmm. um, so when I die, there will still be uh, 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 the possibility of other people engaging with real objects out there in space. So that we'll leave that to one side. Um, the second form of objectivity, which I think is crucial for Kant, and actually which Hegel praises in Kant as well, 
is that objectivity is determined by um, universality and necessity. So um, Kant argues uh, uh, that if we ask, if we think of ourselves as relating to an object, and we ask, what does it mean to relate to that object as an object? And he says, we mean that it sort of constrains us to think about it in a certain way. And that in turn requires that our intuitions of that object be united in a certain way that accords with whatever we take the object to be. Um, and really, that's what objectivity is. So we might think of ourselves as relating to something else and our ideas as having to correspond with something else. But in fact, to think of that object as objective is really to think of it as requiring us to think of it in a certain way. You know, I see a dog and taking it to be a dog requires me to think of it as slobbering and going wolf and wagging. Mm -hmm. That's part of what it is for me to think of it as a dog. Mm -hmm. And so the same is true of categories. To think of myself as encountering an object for Kant is to think of my intuitions as synthesized in a certain way, in, a, in accord with certain categories. So what this, what this translates into is that what I mean by objectivity is that my intuitions are governed by certain necessary universal categories. And so objectivity isn't a matter of correspondence between the way I think and what I take to be out there. It's rather a difference between thinking in a way that's constrained by certain categories and thinking in a way that's free, you know, at the play of my imagination. Mm. Objective thinking is thinking that is necessitated by the concept of whatever it is that I take myself to be encountering. Now, I think Hegel applauds a lot of that, 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 that the mark of objectivity in my thinking, the way that I know that what I'm thinking is objective is necessity, universality, the fact that I must think in this way. Now, that might still leave the skeptic thinking, well, well, surely I can feel an internal constraint to my thinking, but then that might not match something else. But Kant's innovation is to say that very idea of matching something objective translates into my thoughts being necessitated to go in a certain way. There's no other way I could establish that I'm thinking objectively because I can't step out of my skin and go and have a look. Mm -hmm. But that applies to the skeptic too. The skeptic can't go and have a look and say, oh, you know what? Being might be different <laughs> from the way you think it is. That's it. This is, this is ridiculous right. in one level. What it means to think an object is to think of, uh, of what we experience as constraint. So, so necessity is crucial. That is the second kind of objectivity. Now, there is, though, a third kind of objectivity, um, which uh, this gets complicated because I think, um, let, let me give you what Hegel's view is and then say something about the cat. Sure. Hegel's view is that there's a third kind of objectivity, and that is the objectivity of the thing in itself, yeah. which Hegel's Kant, and I stress Hegel's Kant, mm -hmm. thinks really exists out there, and, uh, and yet we can't reach it. So having just said that objectivity consists in a certain necessity within my experience, Hegel's Kant then introduces this other kind of objectivity that we can't get, namely the objectivity that would consist in knowing what's really out there in itself. Mm -hmm. And Hegel says, okay, Kant, so you've got a good idea of objectivity. Objectivity is, uh, is characterized by certain necessity among our representations. And then you go and ruin it by thinking that that whole space is subjective because we can't get the real out there. Uh, and, and Hegel says, actually, you know what? We can get the real out there. Uh, and it's not so removed from the world of experience as Kant thinks it is, and, and, you know, and I'm going to show you the categories that inform that world. So Kant, uh, Kant's, Hegel's Kant's thing in itself then gets explained in the course of the logic as 
being and all its categories and ultimately what Hegel calls the concept. Okay, the problem is that doesn't quite match what Kant thinks he's doing. So if I can now go from Hegel's Kant to Kant's mm -hmm. Kant, Kant thinks that the thing in itself is just a concept that we posit mm -hmm. in order to make sense of the fact that our experience is limited. Kant does not say and cannot say there's really an existing thing out of, uh, in itself out there that we can't reach. That's what Hegel's Kant thinks. That's what Hegel's Kant thinks. But Kant's Kant doesn't think that. Kant's Kant simply thinks that to understand mm -hmm. the realm of experience as limited in some way is just to posit mm -hmm. this thing in itself. Um, and we don't need to look over the fence and peer at this thing and see that it's not in space and time. We know that it can't be in space and time because we know that space and time belong to us. So actually, from Kant's point of view, um, we are not really missing something. Mm -hmm. It's not like mm -hmm. there's a sphere of being out there that we're somehow failing to think. Mm -hmm. No, we are experiencing a realm of objectivity marked by the necessity and universality that's introduced into experience by categories. But we then got to think that a complement of that is a space of things in themselves that we just think to be there. There's nothing to be known about that sphere. We don't have access to it because it's not like it's really there. We just have to think of it in order to make sense of of our um, categories and forms of intuition is limited. Now, when things get to the moral philosophy, it's a little different, mm -hmm. and we have moral grounds for thinking, well, maybe we can think that there's a sphere of freedom and so on. But in the, in the theoretical area, um, that, that, that we can't think that. So from Kant's point of view, really, we only need worry about the first two forms of objectivity. There's the objectivity mm -hmm. of things in space, and there's the objectivity that's a function of the necessity of our categories. And the whole idea of a thing in itself is simply a thought that enables us to regard um, what we experience as limited. And actually, it also enables us to think of as being affected in a certain way. But we only think of ourselves in that way. Mm. Hegel thinks that, that something serious is being missed, mm. namely being in itself. Mm. And, and in case people are listening to this and wondering, thinking, what the heck are you talking about? <laughs> Let me just introduce another distinction that I think is really important there. For Hegel's Kant, the thing in itself and being coincide. Mm. So for Hegel's Kant, mm. the thing in itself is, it exists, it's there, and we don't know it. For Kant's Kant, the thing in itself is not being. Mm. It's just a thought. Mm. It's a correlate of the idea that our experience is limited. Now, it is true that for Kant, thought can't think being, but that's not because being is somehow located mm -hmm, over there mm -hmm, in the sphere mm -hmm, of being mm -hmm. itself. Um, so I think this is the problem that, that Hegel is conflating the thing in itself and being mm. and attributing that conflation to Kant. Mm. Um, and that's why Hegel thinks there's a third form of objectivity that Kant's missing. But I don't know that Kant would agree with mm. that. I think, no, I'm not missing anything. I'm, I mean, we posit this notion of the thing in itself. We need to. But to be honest, our objectivity that we need to worry about is over here. It's in experience. Um, I, I fear that was, uh, was perhaps more complicated no, no, than no, some no, reasons might want. No, it was very good. Very but good, I don't know how to explain no, it in no, a simpler no, no, way. No, it, it's complicated. I guess the question, I, the follow-up I have on that is on the second form of universal and, and universality and necessity is – if this is a second form of being objective that is mediating from our experience, is there not implicit within that objectivity some type of subjectivity? Is, is that not somewhere in yes, there? Yeah? Yes, absolutely. For Kant, certainly, for Kant, certainly, um, obviously, that what goes with the, 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 because objectivity for Kant is grounded in the categories and the source of the categories is transcendental perception. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so for Kant, at least, the, the ground of the very concepts in terms of which we think of something as objective mm -hmm. is actually the structure of transcendental mm -hmm. perception. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Hegel, I think, um, 
it's a little different because I think Hegel wants to argue that the categories are inherent in thought, yes, although at the beginning of the logic, we don't think of thought as transcendentally apperceiving. I think this is where one of the ways in which I differ from, from Robert Pippin. At the beginning of thought, we just think of thought as, as indeterminate. Mm -hmm. But Hegel also wants to make the claim that those categories are inherent in being. Mm -hmm. Now, Kant doesn't say that. Kant doesn't say that at all. Um, and that's because being, Kant calls being at one point just the positing of a thing. Mm -hmm. So, I have the thought of $100, and if I'm lucky, I can posit $100 there in front of me on the table. Um, and it's only when I've posited those $100 in front of me on the table can I say that they are. Mm. Simply thinking of the $100 uh -huh. doesn't make them be. Yeah. Now, actually, in terms of the concept of $100, Hegel would agree. But Hegel thinks that the other fundamental categories um, don't work like that that actually when I'm thinking being, I am thinking being that is. Mm. And through the very thinking of it, I'm in touch with and bringing to mind the being that there is. So that as I go through the logic, and I think what it is to be something, I'm not just having my bright ideas about what it is to be something, I'm thinking what it is to be something. Mm -hmm. uh, what it is to be a cause, to be a mechanical, a living object. Um, now, that's obviously, Kant wouldn't go along with that at all. He wouldn't like that uh, um, in, in, in any regard. Um, so I'm not quite sure whether that answered no, your no, question no. or it, not. It, it but, certainly but did. Maybe that, that will do. It certainly, it certainly did. So just real quick, uh, how is it possible with the speculative logic, how, for Hegel, how is it possible in his mind, you know, actually, to come to something without presuppositions. Like that's, that's his main th th thesis here. How, right. how okay. is that possible? <clears throat> um, through abstracting. Mm. It's, it's the, the, the Hegel thinks that thought has the capacity to abstract away. Um, now, uh, Fichte, I suppose, is a precursor of Hegel in this respect. Descartes, I've already mentioned. Mm -hmm. But even Kant, actually, if you think of the way Kant sort of tries to isolate the uh, forms of intuition from the categories and from sensations, he says, you know, you take, take a body, your experience of a body, strip away in thought the sensory component, strip away the categorical component, the fact that it's a substance, and you're left with this pure form of, of, of space. Now, Kant himself there is engaging in a kind of process of abstraction yeah. in which he's separating out different aspects of things. And, and we do this all the time. We say, well, let's look at, you know, such and such as an X mm -hmm. or as a Y as opposed to in the right. round. So I think it's the capacity of thought to abstract. Um, and so Hegel's view would be start with being. We all make claims all the time that there is a car's just gone by when we're talking. Mm -hmm. And I would take that it has just gone by, it is out there in the world. So we take an our ordinary sense of being and we just strip away all that we normally associate with that. Yeah. You've already mentioned existence. Yeah. We could mention uh, uh, being in space and time. We could mention being um, an object subject to causality. But then we can get even more minimal. We can strip away the very idea that to be is to be something mm. at all. Mm strip away the very idea that to be is be determinate. And so through that process of abstraction, Hegel thinks, you gradually reduce what you take being to be down to sheer indeterminate immediacy. And he says, even then you've got to be careful. Do not think of being or indeterminate immediacy as indeterminacy, as immediacy. Because if you do that, you will think of being as the negation of determinacy mm. or the negation of mediation, and you'll just make it determinate mm. again. So this is why one's got to be, one's got to abstract, one's got to be very careful to hold at bay various um, associations that are normally attached to being. And one's also got to hold at bay 
various concepts that we might actually use in the thinking of being. Mm. Um, and it's, if you're wondering what I'm getting at there, think about the beginning of the logic, the paragraph in which he talks about being. And he says that, uh, I can't remember his exact wording, but, but being is, uh, is, is not unequal within itself or outwardly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he's using the idea of unequal. Mm -hmm. It has no, I think it has no difference within itself or outwardly. So he's invoking the idea of difference. Mm. And he's saying that being doesn't have difference. So you might think, okay, Hegel, well, you're thinking of being as not difference. Mm. Well, no, he isn't. Mm. Because that would just render being determinate again. Mm. He's thinking of being as lacking mm -hmm. difference. Mm. Now, there's a difference, if you don't, <laughs> we don't want to get too complicated, but there's a difference between thinking of being as lacking X, Y, Z, and thinking of being as the negation of X, Y, Z. If you think of being in the latter way, you're just converting it back into the determinate negation of whatever it is you're talking about. And Hegel thinks, no, we, we mustn't do that. We must just think being and stop mm. and hold all the other concepts at bay. And we do that, Hegel thinks, through language. Um, you know, the, the, the first, it's not even a sentence, a sentence fragment, being, pure being without any further determination. That expression without any further determination doesn't define being. It's, it's an injunction. It enjoins us to think being and stop. Mm. Don't give any further determination. Mm. Don't go further. Mm. And that is an act of abstraction that requires effort and the ability to hold fast to being in its abstractness. Um, also, Hegel says, abstracting indeed from the very process of abstraction that gets us mm -hmm. there. Because of course, this is another criticism that could be made. Okay, Hegel, you go through this process of abstraction to get to being, but then isn't the being that you've got inevitably the result of that abstraction? Mm -hmm. So how can it be pure? Right. No, Hegel says you've got to set that to one side. Mm. You've got to just take being in the immediacy um, that being brings with it, mm. pure being brings with it. Um, so I would say, the, again, I'm repeating myself, the answer is abstractness yeah. and the capacity to hold at bay other associations and implications that would normally attach themselves to a concept like being. Mm. And this is why Hegel talks about the effort of the concept, mm. the Anstrengung des Begriffs. Mm. It's an effort. Yeah. And uh, we know it's an effort because it's very hard to do, and it's very hard not to let being slip into nature or existence or something like that. Yeah. So whether that's convincing, you'll have to uh, <laughs> judge. No, that's but good. that's, that's how he thinks you no, do that's it. That's good. It's good. It's good. So let, let's talk about <clears throat> this, this move from becoming to, to determine it being, and you can, is a type of example of uh, uh, sublation. So before you answer that, obviously he's not the first person to talk about becoming, you can define what that is or how, you, uh, how Hegel would use it. Um, Parmenides, uh, Heraclitus, all the pre-Socratics talked about becoming <coughs> um, long ago. Obviously after Hegel, you had uh, Nietzsche talked about it a lot. Uh, mm -hmm, Heidegger mm -hmm. talked about it. Uh, so if you want to, if you want to sprinkle in a little Nietzsche there as well, you can do that. But how do we, how do we, um, how do we understand? You can define the impact or influence of these these uh, pre-Socratic philosophers of this concept of becoming and define how he defines that. But really, what I'm interested in is is how does he see becoming on the trail or on the way to determinate being as this example of sublation? Okay. Um Right, I'll get to that in one minute. Just a brief comment on the idea of, um, if you like, of sort of influence. This is a, this I think is quite quite an important idea. Um, I think one's got to distinguish the, let's call it the historical process that Hegel went through mm. in working out his ideas. Mm. Um, and it's very evident that a lot of philosophers play a very significant role in that process, including Plato, Aristotle, Kant, Heraclitus, and, and, and others. So they're all having an influence. Um, and, and Hegel highlights at various points in the logic or in the lectures on the history of philosophy um, the, the importance that different philosophers have. We've got to distinguish that from the process of derivation and justification within the logic. 
and I'm a little wary of saying that that any of those philosophers have, like, have an influence in the course of the logic, because of course I want to argue that the development of the logic is purely imminent. Mm. That what Hegel is is doing is is deriving the categories from one another mm. in a purely logical way. Now, if at some point in the course of the development, he's got to help himself to Heraclitus or bring in Leibniz to get the thing going, right. then obviously there isn't any, any, uh, any um, uh, imminence anymore. So I'm trying to have it both ways and say, yes, absolutely, Heraclitus, um, among a number of others, did have an influence on, on Hegel. It's important. But that can't be allowed to uh, extend to the actual imminent development within the logic. Right. Okay. All right. On, on, on becoming itself, I think um, it's just worth reminding ourselves that Hegel's beginning with pure being, um, and in contrast to some philosophers, and maybe Robert Pippin would be an example uh, of this, sure. Hegel doesn't think that the thinking of being is a failure. Mm. It's not like we're trying to think being, and we can't do it because it's too indeterminate. On the contrary, Hegel thinks we succeed in thinking being, and what does being prove to be? It proves to be its own vanishing into nothing. That's what pure being is. Mm. We're not failing to think being by thinking it vanishing into nothing. That's what pure being is. And similarly, with nothing. We don't fail to think nothing. We succeed in thinking pure nothing as the vanishing back into being. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that vanishing of each into the other is just what he calls becoming. So becoming, for Hegel, initially at the start of the logic, has nothing to do with time. It has nothing to do with the becoming of something. Mm. It's just that vanishing of pure being and nothing into one another. Uh, and, 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 and it's important. Pippin views this differently, yeah? yeah. Sorry? It, Robert Pippin views this a little bit differently, is, is, is what you're saying. I, I think so. Um, yes, I think that, that, that Robert Pippin, um, as far as I can see, doesn't really distinguish um, between becoming and being determinate. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. there is a remark, uh, he makes to that end. Um, if I can just quote this, mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. um, uh, um, I think he says that becoming is something's being what it is by not being what it's not. Uh, in case people want to look this up, it's, it's in, uh, Hegel, uh, Hegel's realm of shadows page uh, 150. Mm -hmm. Becoming is something's being what it's not by by not being what, sorry, being what it is, apologies, mm -hmm. being what it is by not being what it's not. Now, in my mind, that, that is not becoming, that's determinate being. Mm. Um, and indeed, it's very hard to understand how Pippin's Hegel could actually think becoming because there is really no vanishing going on. It, Pippin's Hegel is not thinking being as its own vanishing. He's rather failing to think being. Mm. <laughs> and that failure is reflectively understood to be the thinking of nothing. Mm. Mm. Well, where's their vanishing there? Mm -hmm. you, you can only have a vanishing if, to put it crudely, you've got being and then you don't mm -hmm. have it. Mm -hmm. the being vanishes. Now that, I think, is Hegel's view. And the word vanishing is used a lot in this whole section. Mm. And the transition from becoming to determinate being is thought through the idea of a vanishing of vanishing. Mm. So clearly, the concept of vanishing is important to Hegel yeah. here. And vanishing only makes sense if we actually succeed in thinking of being as vanishing. Mm. Um, okay, so um, if you can just bear with yeah, me, yeah, then, yeah. think of think of becoming as the vanishing of being into nothing and of nothing into being. So what's happening there? Well, on the one hand, the difference between the two is disappearing. Being is vanishing into nothing. Mm. It's proving to be nothing, and nothing's vanishing into being. So there's an identity there. Mm an identity in which their difference sort of disappears before our very eyes. But equally, it doesn't disappear. Mm. Because what happens? Being vanishes into nothing, vanishes into being again. Mm. So this is an odd structure that Hegel will actually call contradictory, where being and nothing both vanish, but in such a way that they don't vanish, because each pops up again as the other vanishes. Mm. So Hegel's thought is very simply the following. If being and nothing are genuinely to vanish, if becoming is really to be the vanishing of being and nothing, then each has to vanish in such a way that it doesn't just pop up again in its purity. Mm 
Eat has to lose its purity. Now, how can it lose its purity? It can only lose its purity insofar as it becomes inseparable from its other. Mm. The only mm. way that being and nothing can cease being purely what they are is if each is inseparable from the mm -hmm. other. Mm -hmm. And so Hegel thinks that the logic, the logical implication of becoming as the vanishing of being and nothing is their vanishing into their unity, a unity in which their purity has definitively vanished. Mm. Now, some people might think, oh, Hegel, you know, you're being nostalgic. You've got this dynamic becoming. And then what do you do? You ruin it all by settling into determinate being again. Mm -hmm. That's not Hegel's way of looking at it. He thinks that the move into determinate being undermines the purity of being and nothing much more radically than becoming does. Mm. Because becoming is contradictory. It, it is the vanishing of being into nothing and nothing into being in such a way that neither vanishes. Mm. You can see this. It's the vanishing of being into nothing, nothing into being. The two re-emerge as they vanish. The way in which they vanish is by losing their purity and uniting with one another, mm -hmm. such that neither is purely itself mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we no longer have any pure being and nothing. And so we no longer have any vanishing because it was the purity of being and nothing mm -hmm. that generated the vanishing in the first place. Mm -hmm. And this is why Hegel says the move from becoming to uh, this unity of being and nothing, which is Dasein or determinate being, Hegel says that happens through the vanishing of vanishing, mm. through the vanishing of, if you like, the, the, the pure difference that generated the vanishing in the first place. Mm. It's not an easy transition, I understand mm. that. But, but the point is that he thinks that um, there's, how do I put this? Um, I wouldn't write this, but maybe for the point of, for the purposes of discussion, there's something almost dishonest about becoming. <laughs> it's pretending to be the vanishing of being a nothing, but it isn't really, because it trades on the reemergence of their purity. Mm. And yet, it's pretending to be the vanishing of their purity. Well, what's the real vanishing of their purity? How do we make explicit the vanishing of the purity of being a nothing? Well, by showing the two to uh, move into, to vanish into, a unity in which neither is purely itself anymore, in which that purity has definitively gone, if you like, forever. It's gone. But the price you pay for that is you, you lose becoming for a while. I mean, it comes back in again later. And, and he says that, that being a nothing settle into this unity of being a nothing, and then that unity of being a nothing is Dasein or determinate being, and then, you know, we... Dasein goes on its merry way. Um, and I think that's a crucial example, okay, of sublation. It's, well, first of all, before we talk about sublation, it's an example of an imminent development in that the move from becoming to determinate being is not made on the basis of some external expectation of what we'd like to have. It's based on making explicit what's going on in becoming. But I think we do have to make this explicit. There's, there's, we're, we're articulating something here that's implicit in becoming, but not explicit in it. And in making that explicit, we move on to a new category. Okay, to what extent is this a sublation? Well, it's a sublation because it's turning being and nothing into moments of a unity that's formed by the two of them. Mm. Now, sublation is a process precisely of something losing its independence and becoming a moment of, dot, dot, dot. It, that's really what sublation is. But the important thing to note is that sublation doesn't presuppose a unity into which something gets taken up. This is the kind of reading that Derrida had. Derrida um, uh, translates sublate as relever, to, to lift up into. And the implication of that is that there's already a unity there into which we lift something up. But in fact, if you look at the, the move from becoming to Dasein, that's not true. Mm. The unity of Dasein arises as being and nothing turn themselves into moments of their unity with one another. They constitute that unity mm. in becoming moments with one another. There isn't a unity prior to their becoming moments. And I think this is crucial.
for sublation. Sublation doesn't presuppose some kind of totality or unity into which things get absorbed. It is constitutive of certain unities through the very process in which things become moments. Mm. They become moments of the very unity they constitute by becoming moments. Mm. Mm. And I think that's really, really important. It's part of why, why I think the logic doesn't have a goal. There isn't a tail wagging the dog, as we like to say. You know, there's, 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 there's just the forward movement. Um, and I think the logic is non-teleological from that point of view. It doesn't have a preset mm. goal. It, 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 it slips forward mm -hmm. by losing and letting go of the purity with which it begins. Mm. And so the process of a logic is a kind of process of impurifying, self-impurification of being a nothing. I think that's what's going on there. Um, does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, it does. When, when you were talking about this, I was thinking about the, the, the vanishing piece of it. And we let go of the purity of the aspect of being. I was thinking about the, the, between the negation and the being, this aspect of all of this sounds as a very... Um, maybe not in terms of conscious for, 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 for us as humans, but this sounds like an active thing. Like this is, this is, this is not a passive thing. That's just kind of going along that there's a lot of this moving forward. There's this vanishing into and vanishing out. It feels active, right? And if, and when it comes to this sublation of these moments in time, there, there's this active thing that's going on, which <clears throat> dovetails into my, my, my kind of follow up there, which is. How understanding what you just explained about Hegel's becoming in, into being, you know, many people will say that, you know, Nietzsche's philosophy was an active philosophy, philosophy of life. It's a very active component to it. And he obviously talks about becoming as well. Do we see, so you can, you can tell me if I'm totally off on the, the activeness of it, but um, where do we see, I guess, the, the kind of, uh, uh, juxtaposition there of Hegel's becoming into being and, and maybe how, you know, someone like Nietzsche talks about uh, becoming. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad you asked that because obviously my, my first book was on Hegel and Nietzsche and that that's, the, you know, and I should make it clear to, um, uh, to your uh, listeners um, that I really started as an enthusiastic Nietzsche. Oh. Um, Nietzsche. Nietzsche was the one who first got me hooked. Yeah. He, um, he has a he has a way and, of and doing I, that. <laughs> yeah, he has a way of doing that. That's right. Yes, yes. On 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 the active uh, part, if I could yeah, just say yeah, something please. briefly, I think we need to distinguish between um, the movement that is made necessary by being uh -huh. and nothing, which isn't activity on our part. Yeah. Um, I think Hegel thinks that being, when it's understood in its indeterminacy, vanishes of its own accord. Mm. Um, and also the logic that takes us forward from becoming to Dasein is the logic that's inherent in becoming itself. Becoming itself is the vanishing mm. of being and nothing, but it's not properly the vanishing that it is. So in that sense, we are following passively what being requires us to think and then what becoming requires us to think. Where there is activity in this very passivity, I think, is specifically in the movement of making explicit what's implicit. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't really see that at the very beginning of the logic, because to be honest, being vanishes so immediately, it doesn't really seem that we're having to do any work for it to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, This is why people think when you've got pure being and they think, well, what is it you're talking about? Surely you've only got nothing. Well, that's the very vanishing happening in front of their mm -hmm. eyes. Mm -hmm. But but the move from becoming to Dasein isn't like that. There's a certain stability with becoming. Mm. You can sort of focus on becoming without immediately feeling you're driven on to the next category. Mm. And in fact, this is true for the whole of the rest of the logic. As you get to a category, you're not immediately impelled to the next one. You've got to make explicit what is implicit in the category to move on to the next one. So I think, and, and Hegel talks about this in the encyclopedia, he talks about the, the positing of what's contained in a concept. And, and Hegel's word positing, Zetzen, which of course is Fichte's word, I think of as making explicit. Yeah. Now, Brandom uses the same expression, mm. and, and it's an aspect of Brandom's thinking that I think is right, that, that Hegel is very much about making explicit what's implicit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just don't 
accept the, the pragmatist implications of, of, of Brandon's view. But I think that phrase is, is, is right. So, so there's activity in, in that sense. But I don't think the activity involves any more than that. Mm. It, it shouldn't involve any more than determining what a category is, determining what's implicit in mm. it, and making explicit what's implicit in that. Um, and if we can hold ourselves to that, then we will, through our activity of making explicit, allow ourselves to be determined by the implications of, of, of categories. So anyway, that's just to get that idea of activity straight. Yeah. Um, Nietzsche, very briefly, this is something actually I, I guess I did refer to in, 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 in my book on Hegel and Nietzsche. Um, one of the things that, this is very crude, but it'll do for the point of view of our discussion, that Nietzsche says is that there is no being, there's only becoming. The being, identity, ego, cause, all these concepts that somehow unify the world are fictions, albeit very necessary fictions, that are part of the process through which we come to terms with becoming. And indeed, even at times, Nietzsche seems to think even becoming, in a sense, is an interpretation that we put on whatever it is we encounter. But, it, but, but let's, let's, allow, let's allow becoming to carry a bit more weight for Nietzsche than that. But what I'm interested in that idea is there is no being, there's only becoming. Hegel would say, no, no, Nietzsche, that's not right. There is being, which is becoming. Being proves to be becoming. And indeed, it proves to be more than that. It proves to be determinate being and being finite and being infinite and being quantitative and so on. And when you think of it in that way, you can see that for all his being radical, Nietzsche preserves an opposition of the understanding. Now, one of the things that got me into studying Hegel and Nietzsche together originally was the fact that they are both critical of the Gegensetzer of metaphysics, the oppositions of metaphysics. But then you see Nietzsche holding on to one of them. One of the classic oppositions of metaphysics, an opposition that Parmenides and Plato would have adhered to as well, namely that between being and becoming. Parmenides' view would be, I guess, there's no becoming because there's only being. Nietzsche sort of inverts that in some way. There's no being because there's only becoming. Hegel would say, look, the, the whole opposition is, 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 is wrongheaded. Mm. That there is being, and being proves to be becoming. Mm. Um, and I think other things follow from that, uh, quite a lot of differences in the way they, they, they think. But, um, but anyway, that, I mean, that's obviously, I think there's a lot more to Nietzsche than that. And if there are Nietzscheans out there listening, <laughs> uh, you know, forgive me, I don't, don't mean to be reductive. I love Nietzsche. <laughs> uh, and, and as if you look, look back at other stuff that I've done, I, I hope one will mm. see. Um, but I think in that respect, Nietzsche is pre-Hegelian. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, and, and I guess people found this a really odd claim but I find so many post-Hegelians are logically pre-Hegelian mm. because they adhere to many of the oppositions that Hegel thinks he's sort of undoing. Mm. Some of them do it deliberately. Some of them do it unconsciously. Mm. Mm. I mean, that's a, a, a grand and maybe presumptuous claim, mm -hmm. but yeah. I'll make yeah, it. Yeah. So just real quick, I, I want to I ask about uh, a little bit of the, the second volume, but um, uh, for listeners, we, we've only been on the first, <laughs> first volume. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, just real quick, just to tie the loop here about with with Dasein. So you talked about the becoming, and then into into uh, uh, into the into Dasein. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we, we mentioned Heidegger before. He loves Dasein. He talks about it all the time. I guess just how for for that that oneness of being and nothing into becoming this this process you talked about that that unity that sublation. Where do we see? I guess Dasein in that that kind of process, and why is that kind of uh, essential uh, for Hegel to understand where where Dasein kind of fits there. Well, Dasein um, obviously for for Hegel means something very different than it does from from Heidegger. Yeah. Uh, for Heidegger, Dasein is simply determinate being. I mean, one of the problems with Dasein from an English language point of view is how on earth you translate it. <laughs> um, uh, Di Giovanni translates it as existence, but the problem is that there's a later category. Mm in the logic of essence called existence. And so yeah. Di Giovanni has to translate that as concrete existence. And I, I prefer just let's stick, let's keep existence in the logic of essence. Mm. And, and mm -hmm. so then what do we do with Dasein? Well, I like the translation determinate being 
only <laughs> there's one sentence in, in Hegel's account, which is in German, uh, uh, das Dasein ist bestimmt das Sein. So then you end up with determinate being is determinate being, which is kind of not very informative. <laughs> so sometimes I just say, well, this, let's just talk about Dasein. Let's just leave it. Um, the point about Dasein is that it's not just Sein. It's not just being. Etymologically, it's being that is da, that is there. Yeah. But Hegel says, forget about the spatial connotations. That's not what we're interested in here. One different way of thinking of it might be Dasein is being that is definite. Mm. It's determinate. Mm. It's this, not that. Whereas pure being is indeterminate. Mm. Remember, pure being is not even not nothing. Mm -hmm. It's just pure mm -hmm. being. It vanishes into nothing, but it's not initially thought of as not nothing because otherwise it would be determinate. So Dasein is just determinate being. So the first move, or the, I suppose the second move in, in, in the logic is that being proves to be becoming, and that then further proves to involve determinate being. So minimally, being is to be determinate, and that is to be this, not that. That splits itself uh, for various reasons into re reality and negation. And then Hegel thinks that in the relationship between reality and negation, which are two forms of Dasein, Dasein relates to itself. Mm. If we make that explicit and think explicitly self-relating being, we have a new form of being that Hegel names something. Mm. So he thinks that to be isn't just to become or to be determinate, it's to be something where something is self-relating determinate being. It, it's, it's, it's being that has the structure of a self, mm. if mm -hmm. you like. It's an itself. Um, and itselfness is integral to being something. Mm. And so minimally, being isn't just being, it's not just determinate, it's being something in relation to something else. And then the rest of the, uh, the first part on quality examines the various other implications that are in that. So, um, so Dasein, Dasein reappears at various points. I mean, one of, the, one of the ways of thinking about this, the way I do this for, for my students, is I do the very thing that Hegel hates, which is use pictorial representations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think of Dasein um, being that is through not being as involving two sides of a difference. So I would put reality and then have a forward slash and negation mm -hmm. to indicate that they're two sides of one difference, that they're joined together at the mm -hmm. hip, mm -hmm. reality and mm -hmm. negation. When we get to something and other, I put circles around those to indicate that they have a self-relating mm. self-relation of their own and that they're separate. So being something and other are separate from one another, mm. but reality and negation are not separate. Mm. Mm. Now, the point is that as we go through the logic, that um, moment of determinate difference being two sides of one difference comes back in again. So when we have something with a limit, we still have something, so you still have your circles, still something is separate from something else, but they're also joined by a limit, a limit which you can represent by a forward slash. So in fact, they're both something and determinate at the same time. And this is sort of typical of the way the logic works. You get certain distinctions, but then you get different combinations of them that come up in the rest of the logic. So a limited something is a something, but that's also Dasein, it's also a determinate something. Um, and the difficulty with Hegel is remembering to do justice to both of those. Not somehow when you get to limit to forget that you're dealing with something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise you just slip back into an earlier position. So determinacy plays an important role. It becomes very important in the logic of essence mm -hmm. um, as well. And I suppose when you get to the logic of the concept, it takes the form of particularity. Mm -hmm. Particularity is the equivalent in in the sphere of the concept of of Dasein in the sphere of being. Yeah, that's it's very, it's very very helpful. It's it's interesting to to hear it explained out that way, especially in connection with how we know Heidegger talks about it differently later. So let's let's do one last kind of uh, uh, topic, I guess. Uh, we we won't touch everything on volume two, of course, uh, sadly. But uh, I think uh, you spend a lot of time, and I think you can probably hit kind of the big things. You move from volume one to volume two, and you talk about, you know, so we've been talking about pure being, determinate being, self-relating being just now. 
um, and that there's this transition to from quality to quantity. And so in volume from volume two, you talk about quality or um, excuse me, a quantity, and you talk about numbers and arithmetic at large. And he he looked at all these things with logic, which is interesting. I, I think you gave an example before about how something is you know short versus the distance, things like that. So you. No, I, it, it first, the, the <clears throat> second volume felt to me, maybe it's because of, you know, Fry Guys here is, is very analytic almost. You know, the, for, volume one is for the, the <laughs> continental folks and volume two is a little bit more of the analytic <laughs> folks, right? Uh, so you give a, a handful of chapters on, 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 on Frege uh, and his project in philosophy. And you discuss some of the six similarities between him and Hegel, which are mathematical equations, having a purely logical ground, logical entities are objective and have a structure of their own. Rejecting psychologism, uh, stress the need for strict proof in philosophy and logic. Truth is the goal of logic. Logic as analytic and yielding new and informa- informative insights. Anyways, they have uh, some similarities, and then there's a main difference on these assumptions between Frege and Hegel. So maybe just kind of, uh, I'll give you as much runway here. Talk about uh, Hegel and quantity and this kind of juxtaposition with Frege and that very analytic tradition and, and what's kind of going on there. All right. Um, okay, there's a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we have a bit of time. We have a bit of time. Um, so uh, the first thing I would say is just think back to Kant mm. and think that we've got the four different sets of categories, the categories of quantity, quality, relation, and modality. And they are epistemically, uh, they work together epistemically. They're, they're, we, 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 we can't separate them. So, mm. so any judgment we make, Kant thinks, will involve an element of all of those. Um, but there's no logical relation between quantity and quality. Um, so however much you think hard about quantity, it's not going to get you to quality. And however much you think hard about quality, it's not going to get you to quantity. And this was, this was uh, 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 exemplified in that idea that the straight line between two points is the shortest. Mm-hmm being a synthetic judgment, not an analytic one. That is evidence of the fact that there is no analytic connection, no, no intrinsic logical connection between quality and quantity or quantity and quality. So Hegel thinks, yes, there is. Although one should say at the start that, 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 that Hegel's way of developing isn't straightforwardly analytic. It's analytic in the sense that any subsequent category is derived imminently from the previous one. But it's not just analytic, because what arises as we make explicit what's implicit in a category is a new category. As we say, you know, becoming goes to determinate being. So when I use the term analytic there, don't don't think that I'm just conflating that with Kant. It's not. Hegel's Hegel's analytic, in inverted commas, is an expanded analytic that involves a synthetic moment of becoming other. Um, All right. So anyway, Hegel thinks that quality gives rise to quantity, and it does so via the idea of the one, das eins. Mm the unit, um, which is an essentially qualitative uh, concept. So um, being one is a further form of being infinitely self-related. So finite things negate themselves. Hegel thinks that infinity, infinity in its true qualitative sense involves basically relating to oneself Mm. in an absolute way. Uh, I mean, there's other subtleties to it, but that that will do for for the minute. Um, and that takes a particular form in the one. So what's interesting is that the one, being one for Hegel, is not conceivable without the idea of qualitative infinity. So being one is is infinitely itself in a more radical way than uh, being something is. And this is marked by the fact that being one initially has no other. Mm. Where something is always connected to another, Hegel thinks that being one just is being one. It's just being for itself. But for a variety of different reasons, Hegel thinks that the one produces a multiplicity of other ones. And so it produces many ones. And indeed, it generates two relations between those many ones, one called repulsion and one called attraction. Repulsion is the the holding apart of one, the fact that every one, as we excludes and holds apart every other one, attraction is the fact that they draw together to constitute one big one, 
And Hegel thinks that both of those are logically uh, entailed by being one. Now, of course, there's a lot of room there for comparison with Plato, and I have a little section mm-hmm. of volume uh, two on or volume one actually on um, on Hegel and Plato on the one and the many. Now, this this idea of a one that continues out beyond itself in the form of other ones, ones that both repel one another and attract one another to form a unity, basically takes us over to quantity. What quantity is, is the continuity produced by there is a wonderful the um, self German commentator on Hegel's logic called Anton Friedrich Koch. And he claims that the one clones itself in producing an exact replica of itself in another one and another one and another mm-hmm. one. That they are utterly identical, but they're external to one another. Mm-hmm. And this is crucial to quantity because Hegel understands quantity to be a continuity of homogeneous units actually very close to what Kant thinks. Um, and um, this is quantity as such, which proves to be divisible, but not always already divided. And it's divisible because it's a continuity that is the continuity established by discrete ones. But their discreteness is, if you like, um, absorbed into their continuity. Um, So that's quantity as such. Now, quantity, therefore, has emerged out of quality because of the way that the one has turned itself into a continuity of many ones that are both discrete and continuous. And so we're in a new sphere now. And this means Hegel thinks quantity is a necessary form of being. Uh, We have a reason why uh, beings, some things, have size. They're not just qualitative. They are quantitative. Um, there's a logic that Hegel traces through them, which argues that, that quantity becomes determinate in the form of a quantum and becomes even more determinate in the form of a number. And a number is a quantum or a unit of quantity um, where the determinacy is um, established by the amount of units it contains. Remember that quantity as such is a cont- continuity of discrete units. That means any quantum or or particular um, portion of quantity will be given its determinacy by the amount of units it contains. So a number then is simply a quantum, a determinate quantity with a certain amount of units. Um, I'll say a bit about Frege, but just to take it on, Hegel then thinks that number takes the form of extensive magnitude, intensive magnitude or degrees for various reasons. He thinks that number also establishes uh, an endless sequence. You can always add one and add one and add one. But that the logic of quantity culminates in uh, what he calls a ratio of powers. And this is where a number relates to itself and multiplies itself by itself and turns itself into its own square. Um, Now, you think, well, that might be an odd way to end. Why would Hegel end with that? Well, because he thinks that what happens at the end of the logic of quantity is that quantity exhibits the structure of being for self, of self-relatedness, that was what generated quantity in the first place. Because the quantity is generated by the one, the one is a form of being for self, of being infinitely for itself. That took the form of, a, of what Hegel calls self-externality, these ones being outside one another uh, as an extended quantity. But then when you get to the end, number relates to itself again. And that's what squaring is about. Num- you know, three multiplies itself by itself and so generates nine, where nine is three squared. And in that movement, quantity exhibits the quality of being for self. Quantity establishes quality. If you make that idea explicit, you get into measure, where quantity is the ground of qualitative differences. So the logic of quantity is sort of bookended by being for self and the one at the beginning, and then quantity or number becoming for itself at the end. And what's interesting is that Hegel thinks that there's something in the very fabric of being, in the very fabric of quantity, that makes squared numbers necessary. And lo and behold, when you look at certain fundamental laws of nature, 
and Hegel's got in mind particularly Galileo's law of fall, uh, Kepler's second law of planetary motion. I guess he could, if he'd known about it, think about Einstein's E equals MC squared. Squaring is really integral mm. to the laws of nature. Anyway, that's, that's the basic structure. Now, why did I, why did I write about Frege? Because you're right, there's over 100 pages mm -hmm. in, in this mm -hmm. volume mm -hmm. two on mm -hmm. Frege. Um, my thinking was the following. Uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not completely blind. I do understand that most people, unless they're real diehards, are not going to be reading an 800-page book on Hegel's logic. <laughs> but I thought, well, maybe <laughs> if someone's interested in this and has a more analytic background, um, there will be one question that will come to mind when they hit Hegel on number, and that is, okay, Hegel, you say all this about number, but we've had Frege. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, Frege was a watershed. Mm -hmm. And so after Frege, logic has changed, thinking about numbers has changed. And interesting though, you are Hegel, you're old, you know, it's old mm -hmm. news. So I thought, okay, I mean, I have worked on Frege a bit before. I quite like Frege actually. Um, so I thought, well, I'll have a go. Mm -hmm. And so I went through trying to, as you noted, first of all, note some similarities between Hegel and Frege, then note some assumptions that I think Frege makes that for me, again, indicate that Frege is a philosopher of understanding. By that, I mean he holds to certain fixed oppositions. And the principal one I think he holds to is that between concept and object. Mm. Um, and just very briefly, concepts for Frege uh, are preceded by an indefinite article, uh, an or a. Objects are preceded by a definite article, the. Mm. Um, and so you can have the Eiffel Tower the Queen of England. And there's only ever one of them. And of course, then Frege gets into problems. Well, what do you do with the concept horse? How can you have the concept without turning a concept into an object? And Frege says, oh, this is my language playing around with things. Um, okay, so I, anyway, I looked, looked through all of that, trying to argue that Frege is in some respects philosophically actually more problematic than his advocates think. Mm. And then I go through the... Um, uh, Frege's uh, foundations of, of arithmetic uh, to look at how he derives number. Mm -hmm. And without going into all the details, don't worry, mm -hmm. um, one of the fundamental differences is that, that Hegel derives number from quantity. Frege doesn't. Mm -hmm. Frege derives number from that basic distinction that he draws between concepts and objects. Both of them try to found the idea of number and indeed arithmetic on logic, but of course they have different logics. And Given that I'd already argued that, uh, from my point of view, the fundamental distinction Frege draws between concept and object, which is based on his distinction between function and argument, is a distinction of Verstand, not Vernunft. Mm. This and various other things renders his derivation of the idea of number problematic. But I didn't want to just assert that, and so I've probably gone overboard in trying to work through the whole of the, the foundations of arithmetic and to show in detail where I think there are problems. But, but in a way, I hope that Frigians will, will see, tries to do justice to, um, uh, to Frege. So that's why Frege's in there. People not interested in Frege can skip those chapters. But so, it, so you're right, that, that was designed partly with analytic philosophers in mind. But also, I guess I wanted to show that I, I accept the point that Frege is important. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and there's, as far as I know, very little on Frege. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, so anyway, that's that. Um, one last point about the material on quantity that, that people might be interested in is um, the longest sections of the logic are the two remarks on calculus. Yeah, yeah. And most people look at those and sort of, run away from, in horror. <laughs> um, I wanted to say, I wanted to examine what Hegel has to say. And um, so I've tried to explain my basic view is that, that Hegel is actually trying to defend calculus against its critics, critics at the mm -hmm. time. And the way he does this is by eliminating the idea of the infinitesimal. Mm -hmm. So one familiar way of understanding dy dx, a differential coefficient, is that it's a relation of infinitesimally small magnitudes. And various people like Barclay and others have criticized that view. I wanted to argue that, that Hegel is with the critics in that he thinks dy dx is not a relation of infinitesimally small magnitudes. It's a relation between what he calls qualitative moments of quantity. 
Okay, but then what on earth does that mean? I think it means that it's a relation between ways of changing, how X changes in relation to the way Y changes. And Hegel thinks that that relation between the ways those two change, when you've got you know, uh, uh, Y equals X squared, and you can plot that on a graph, X and Y change, the relationship between the ways they change, the qualities of their change, the how of each is expressed in the differential coefficient. Mm. So if you've got y equals x squared, obviously that generates a whole series of numbers, but the relationship between the ways they change produces a constant ratio of 2x. Mm. And in that constant ratio is expressed the constant relation between the ways in which one changes in relation to the way in which the other change. Um, it's a philosophically understanding of, of uh, calculus. It doesn't really make any difference to the mathematics mm -hmm. of it. I mean, Hegel's yeah. not challenging the mathematics, mm -hmm. but it provides a way of defending philosophically um, calculus by eliminating the idea of an infinitesimal. Now, Hegel's not the only one to do that, of course. Um, but I thought, um, you know, the mathematicians and philosophers can, can do what they want with, 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 with that material. But I wanted to show people that Hegel, uh, first of all, knew a lot of, uh, about calculus. He, he read Lagrange, Cauchy, and a number of others. Um, and that it's worth reading. And it's not something one should be afraid of, actually. Um, there's a very interesting philosophical point mm, there. Yeah. So that is part also of the account of quantum. No, yeah, that's, that's, that's so wonderfully uh, expressed. I mean, it, I'm, not, I'm not a big analytic person, but I, I really appreciate it, the contribution you have uh, in, in volume two there. So I think that's, that's very, very helpful. So I guess the, the, the last two questions here to kind of tie it all together is uh, many people will be familiar with Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit, uh, which I think is published just before the logic. Um, how do you see the kind of connection between the two, which is kind of a general bridge that he has between the two, if there is one? And as a final question, uh, you know, you've written, you know, such a you know, wonderful uh, piece on, on, on Hegel, you know, as, as you said, over 800 pages. What are the, the biggest takeaways you want people that read it uh, uh, to, to get from it? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, on the phenomenology, um, uh, I should say that I follow um, Hans Friedrich Fulda in arguing that Hegel thinks there are two ways into the logic. There is a direct way, um, which is just suspending our assumptions, abstracting. Hegel talks at two different places about a certain resolve or decision, entschluss, to think freely. Um, and that is quite direct. You just set aside your assumptions and you just begin with pure being. The second way is through the phenomenology. And so um, I think that the phenomenology, on my reading at least, is not essential. It's not the way you have to go in, but it does provide a justification of the unity of thought and being we talked about earlier that constitutes the sort of element of the logic. For those who are skeptical about that from the point of view of ordinary consciousness. So <clears throat> Hegel is interested in <clears throat> um, what ordinary non-philosophical consciousness would make of the position of philosophy. And ordinary philosophical consciousness thinks, look, I'm over here, there's a tree over there, how on earth can you say that somehow my understanding of the tree is identical with the tree? It clearly isn't. And so Hegel takes a whole series of shapes of consciousness, um, beginning with the simplest sense certainty, which just thinks it confronts immediately this here now in space and time over against I here now. Um, and Hegel works through a series of experiences he thinks are generated by each of these shapes of consciousness. And to cut a very long story short, he thinks that at the end, um, in the section he calls absolute knowing, consciousness or self-consciousness comes to the understanding that the form of subjectivity and the form of being are one and the same. Hegel uses different terms to express that, substance and subject, thought and being, uh, you could also say subject and object as well. Um, but the idea is that what the phenomenology does then 
is progressively and systematically undermine from within uh, various shapes of consciousness which are subtly different from philosophy. Not to dispose of them, but to say that they can't provide a foundation from which to challenge the perspective of philosophy. And in fact, if anything, the implications of those shapes of consciousness lead on to the position of philosophy, which is where thought and being uh, are identical in structure, where the structure of thought is the structure of being and vice versa. Um, so phenomenology has that um, structure. I think <clears throat> phenomenology is different from philosophy. I think Hegel, hmm. Hegel's phenomenology is phenomenology. In, in a sense that we should take seriously, in that it's not metaphysics and it's not ontology. It's systematic, it's dialectical, it's rigorous, but it is a working through of the experiences that are generated when consciousness takes the object to be a certain way. So to put this very dramatically and, and, and to sort of over-exaggerate the point, if you want to know what Hegel thinks about the world, don't go to the phenomenology. Mm. Because strictly speaking, you won't know. All you will know is that Hegel thinks, if you think about the world in this way, it'll generate this experience. If you think about the world in this way, it'll generate this experience. And that linkage of experiences gets us to um, the end. So the phenomenology, I think, is scientific in Hegel's sense, it's systematic and rigorous, but it's not part of philosophy. It's a propodeutic to philosophy that leads us into mm. it. Um, I think it's a fantastic work, um, and I still think it's important, and it's not. Uh, it's not in any way rendered redundant by, by the logic, but I just think the logic is, is the beginning and the core of Hegel's philosophy as part of his phenomenology. Mm. Um, okay, what, what key takeaways? Um, I guess, first of all, I hope that people will have a better understanding of what it means for speculative logic to be systematically presuppositionless. I spend a lot of time yeah. on that. And what it means and what it doesn't mean, you know, I spend a lot of time on, on showing that, that there are presuppositions, historical, linguistic, hermeneutic presuppositions, to a logic that is systematically presuppositionless. Mm. So I'm hoping to clarify that, explain why I think this is important, why logic has to begin with pure being, and how we have to sustain that uh, presuppositionless imminent method as we go through, and, and what that then can open up about the logic. I mean, I think that by sustaining this method throughout the logic, we can come to understand and see things that we might not otherwise see if we read it in a certain way. Um, that's one thing. I also want people to think about the logic not just in terms of its generalities. Now, the generalities are very important. Is Hegel a metaphysician? How does he relate to Kant? How does my view relate to that of Robert Pippin? You know, and, and, and there's all those, those things that are very interesting. Is, is the logic an ontology, is it not? Yes, it's all important. But I think that, that there is a danger that if we focus too much on that, we'll forget that the book itself is 800 pages long and it has a lot of details. Yeah. And I want to say that those details matter. And I comment at some point in, in Hegel on Being, uh, I say that, you know, Hegel, as Nietzsche said of Wagner, is a great miniaturist. I think Nietzsche knew what he was talking about. You know, Wagner has the great sweep of music, but there's a lot of fine detail in Wagner that Nietzsche was sensitive to, and I want us to be sensitive to that in Hegel. Hegel is a great miniaturist. It's the minute little details and changes that I think are significant, and people won't be interested in all of them, but... I would want people to be drawn into those and to, to think about them and also to think, is Hegel right? Mm. You know, I mean, I'm not wanting to sort of bludgeon people into submission. I want, I want to try and give them a way of understanding Hegel so that they can, those details are opened up to them, but that they take them seriously. Um, so I want to help readers understand the details of Hegel's argument. Um, I want to help people understand the text. So I hope what they take out of this book is... Uh, a, a, a new, a sort of, a, well, you mentioned it before. I, I, I think that was very kind of you to say that, that, it, that it, it's sort of a compliment to reading the text. So that if you're struggling with a bit, well, go and look at Hegel on Being, and, mm -hmm. uh, and that will help you with part mm -hmm. of it. Um, uh, and then I guess I think there are a series of claims that Hegel makes throughout, of the, lo throughout the logic, which can to some extent be abstracted from the method. Um, 
To be is to be something and to be is to be finite. That's crucial. To be is to be finite. Things end. We're all going to end. That's absolutely vital. And, and yet from that, Hegel thinks, a new conception of infinity arises, which can be exhibited by finite things. Finding oneself in the other is a quality of finite being. I'm sorry, of infinite being. Let me get that right. Is a quality of infinite being exhibited by finite things. A lot of philosophers think, well, because we're finite, you know, the infinite is either beyond us or it doesn't exist. Mm. But Hegel's thought is no. Actually, infinity, true infinity, can be exhibited by finite beings and mutual recognition. Love are forms of qualitative infinity mm. that finite beings exhibit. Mm. Now, not all infinity is like that for right. Hegel, but, but take quantitative infinity, which is the way a number relates to itself. That relating to itself, squaring itself, is a quality exhibited by a finite number, yeah. not beyond, it's here. So I think that's really important to me, that Hegel is a philosopher of this world who thinks that infinity in its various forms is something that can be exhibited in this world by finite beings. Mm. But he has a whole lot of other stuff about mm. measure, for example, that things have their measure. They can get too big to be what they are. And if they get too big, they will be destroyed. He even says, one of his examples is, we can be too wealthy. Mm. You can think you accumulate money and you accumulate money and then you reach a point, it flips over and it has dangerous consequences. Mm -hmm. Now, I think those specific ideas, and there's a lot more, are really interesting and matter. And so I would like people to take those out as mm -hmm. well. Um, and um, yeah, well, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, it's up to other readers to, uh, to decide whether they, they find these things, but that's what I hope they'll find. It. Absolutely. Well, the, the two volumes, uh, it's a Hegel on Being, uh, volume one, Quality and the Birth of Quantity and Hegel Signs of Logic. And the second volume, Quantity and Measure in Hegel's Science of Logic, are out through Bloomsbury. Uh, Stephen, this was such a delight. I had so much fun uh, talking with you about all of these important concepts. You explain it so well. Uh, I cannot say uh, anything but my biggest thanks and biggest gratitude. Uh, very, very appreciative for you coming on and, and, and giving us the full download of of all of your, your thoughts on Hegel. I really appreciate it. Good. Well, ditto, I'd like to thank you for, for taking the time to, first to read this and also setting this up. Um, and again, thank you to all your listeners um, for taking the time uh, to, read, to, to, to think about this stuff and to read this stuff. I realize it's not easy, but, but it, you know, it, it is, uh, the philosophy can be quite a, an, an isolating activity mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we spend a lot of time on our own mm -hmm. thinking. Um, I get a lot of joy at going to conferences and obviously through my students and peers, but, but something like this where I'm sort of reaching out mm. to, to a larger audience, mm. it, it does really reaffirm the idea that there is a community of people out Absolutely. there uh, interested in important things. And uh, so I thank you for facilitating this. And again, thank the listeners. Yeah, um, of course. Uh, thank you. Good. Okay. All the very best. And I wish you a, a, a good day for you. Good evening for me.